Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. It's me, Sergeant Killer Snow, and I'm here to go ahead and make sure that my volume is on, first and foremost. Yes, it's on. Okay, so what we're actually here to do is just to quickly go over a few simple concepts in coding for Unity. Just real quick, it was a refresher assignment kind of deal where we were given, you know, these scenes with a single script each, and we had to put in that single script the necessary code to make it work the way that we were told it needed to work. We were not allowed to add anything to the scenes. We were not allowed to add anything to anything with the exception of adding components and scripts to pre-existing stuff. And uh, that, that's just about it. So to start off with, we're gonna go to the adventure scene. And here the point is to code the adventure to pick up the sword, which lets them run into the dragon and destroy it. Also meaning that we had to code movement. Each one of these scripts has a different, has a, a separate movement code. This one does not have up and down movement because it wasn't required, so I didn't put it. Go left, you grab the sword, and it prints out sword found. That's, that's kind of important there. And then we go to the right, and then the dragon is slain. We have printed those out as input, but technically we weren't even supposed to put the, uh, the printouts. Now what happens if we go ahead and try and touch the dragon without the sword? Well, then we just die. And it says, defeated by the dragon. Lovely. So, that was nice and simple. That was an easy start. Let's go up to Battle Hearts. So, the point of this one, let me pull up the code here. We had to code the Battle Witch to have full range of float movement, where she can just fly around. But also, we had to make it so if you press the space bar, she teleports straight to her uh, pentagram. Every time. Done and easy. Not bad, right? Then we get a little fun. The Brundle Lab, which is very similar to the teleporter concept of the fly. Uh, we have our little Brundle fly here. And the point of this one was to make it so that way if it goes into either of the teleporters, it'll teleport it to the other one. So that had a native problem. So initially when you code that, it's kind of like on a collision enter teleport to this position. Now, if you made the positions equal to one another, therein is gonna be a problem because then you're entering each one and it's just gonna spit you around back and forth between each of the teleporters at that point if you land directly on top of the collision box. So what we did is we have our full up and down motion, but it also required that we don't go over or under the floor and we didn't add anything to the scene. They had invisible barriers on the top and bottom that we had to put collision on and stuff so the point here is to pop pop and as we can see there's no glitches or issues with this method of teleportation we can go up it'll teleport us out the top bottom we're just not small enough to get past the teleporter doors which is totally fine now if I were to, say, change that even a little bit, I just changed it by one unit. One single unit. One. One number off. Not 100 units, not 10. One. One unit. You ready? Welcome to a perpetual life of hell. This is why it's important to test your stuff and get your values correct. So, let me go ahead and change that back since I haven't technically submitted this yet and I don't want to submit something that's busted. Alright, that's done. We'll compile, we'll test it again just to be sure that our code is clean and functional. Bangers and mash. Beautiful. Also our character flips, which is a nice little thing. Uh, all right, next we have the Limbo Boy. Limbo is actually a game that exists. Uh, a few of these things are games that exist, obviously. So the point for Limbo Boy was simply to make it so that way when we walk past this block, that the Limbo Boy is always going to be behind the block, which is a sort order problem. So we change the sort order and we are walking behind it. Whereas beforehand, we were walking in front of it and you could see Limbo Boy's eyes. So that one was much simpler. We'll go on to the Scribble Knots light, which is also very simple. 
the point of this one is when you are playing it, when you let go of the space bar or are not pressing the space bar, the light is off and blue. As we know, in the world, when there's no light, there's always a dim. That's obviously just a media thing, but video games are media. So when you hit space bar, the light, it's there. When you release it, Try it to go as fast as possible, try and break it, it doesn't break, it's good. Cool. So, that one was nice and easy. Then we get to the complicated one. Then we get to the one that wanted to be an annoyance to me, and as you can see, I had to do a little bit more here in the code. And what I did there was we created a quick coroutine to establish what direction to go in with this uh, function of get direction. So what this says is, if there's a rigid body, meaning if this thing has the capability to move, we're going to roll and determine what value that roll is between the minimum and maximum values. And then we're going to pick a direction based off that. And then for time immeasurable, because when you put this in the for loop, it means that for infinite infinite, then we're going to get the direction, which will run this and force the roll to be something different than what it was. And then we go ahead and move our position because this whole game is supposed to be hands off. It's, it's like one of those uh, idle games. You tell it to do something and it'll do the thing and then you don't do anything else with it. That is the point of using this coroutine to change our positioning and then we have it waiting 0.2 seconds every time before it does that. This is what we wind up with. Hands off. Yeah. So the point of this is to try and use code and logic and problem solving to determine how to create like a, a randomized patrol or random pathing without the use of AI and nav mesh and um, waypoint lists and things like that. And off it goes. All right, that one took a little while because uh, trying to get the, um, the enumerators to work and the coroutines in general, it was being a little annoying. I'm not gonna lie. Like I was doing things right, but it kept on like giving me red errors and saying things were wrong. And then I would delete it all, rewrite it exactly the same, and it's fine. I, I don't understand why. We'll just call that a little Unity quirk, right? Next up is Super Mario. And uh, basically the same concept as the adventure where we move left, right to interact with things only this time they wanted a score to print out and to update itself so for that we just changed our collision code from the adventurer which was if you collide with something it'll set va uh, values and make things false and blah 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 it's the same thing so we run into another object and if the other object's name starts with coin we increase our score by one which means we add one and make our score equal to whatever value that it used to be plus that new one and then print, so that way it tells us what our score is, and then it makes the coin inactive. Let's see how that plays out. So I can move up, down, left, right, so I have a range of motion there. And then we have a little, like, tap of a collision um, delay. So basically you hit it and it stops for a microsecond because it's colliding with something, but then we see that it prints out point count one, two, three, four, five, six. That's done. And lastly, we have our treasure room. Now for the treasure room, the treasure trophy, which is this white sprite right in the middle, it needs to be different colors. And we want it to change colors on a random timer, right? So, mm, okay, no, I already set the, uh, the minimum and maximum for the timers um, as public floats so they can be altered here. So you see my mouse, it says right there, M time minimum and M time maximum. Zero is the minimum, five is the maximum. That is assumed to be in seconds. So our main code here goes ahead and when we start the game, it makes like a, an array, a list of colors and it gets our sprite renderer, stuff like that, and then it starts the coroutine. And what the coroutine does is, for infinite amount of time, 
it goes ahead and sets the value of our timer to be a random time between our time minimum and our time maximum because they said to randomize it and they were like do a roll between 0 and 40 every frame in update to do this and i was like why would i do that when i can just have this because this coroutine routine isn't going to run every frame it starts when the game starts and it will go through its cycle and it won't cycle itself again until it completes the wait time in the timer and then it runs the code again and then it runs the code again and then it infinitely you get it so i didn't want to do it on update which updates every single frame just for the chance of randomizing a zero to 40 roll so we saw that it started out yellow turned to green one two three four five one two uh, it, yep cool so it's randomizing at a random timer between zero and five and we can go ahead and set that minimum right here we're going to change that to i think i made them floats as well yeah so we're going to set this to 3.5 as a minimum so when we hit play it should cycle those colors a little bit faster because it's not waiting a full five seconds at at the most now it's waiting at most 3.5 seconds but it's still picking randomly between 0 and 3.5 seconds all right that's it i hope you all enjoyed that if you want to know anything more about the code that was used you can go ahead and ask in the comments you can jump into my discord you can do any of that i appreciate y'all for being here frosty <laughs>